Hey, come on in. We are really, really fortunate today to have a group, our HRDM advisory board here, and we have a, a group of outstanding, uh, really smart people to help us understand some things that we don't teach enough uh, in our program that I think that we're going to continue to educate you all on. So I'm happy you're here. I see a lot of garment in the room. I like that. It's homecoming. I know. So there's two panels. Doug, good morning. Siri. <laughs> All right, we got a big group of students coming in, and then I think we'll get started. Come on in. Happy Can Friday. You? Yeah. Good morning, all of you guys in Zoom land. We wish you could be here with us today. Uh, let's see. I guess we'll wait on. Oh, no, down here. Okay. All right. So I have 10 o'clock, so I will go ahead and get started. I want to welcome you all. Uh, my name is Robin DePetro. I'm the director of the School of HRTM. And we are fortunate today on Homecoming Friday to have our uh, HRTM advisory board here, as well as to have a panel on Hotel Finances 101. And it's really to just give you guys some more insight um, into possible careers and, and to give you some more knowledge that maybe you, you didn't get or maybe you're uh, thinking you don't need. Come on in, have a seat. Thank you, thank you. Right. So I want to introduce today uh, the two moderators for our session. And I want to thank them from the bottom of my heart for all the work they put into getting this panel together and getting them prepared uh, to help you learn things that maybe you didn't know, and maybe you did, and, and if you did, we'll talk about careers. So uh, Andrea Belfonte is here uh, with the International Society of Hotel, or no, Hospitality Consultants, uh, and then John Shellhase is here from uh, Atlanta with IHG Luxury Properties, right? IHG Hotels and Resorts. IHG Hotels and Resorts, there you go. So anyways, I want to uh, give them the floor, and uh, let's give them a big game pack welcome. <laughs> Questions via Zoom. George is moderating that. If you've got questions in the room, I'm going to pause occasionally. And let's do a quick check on Zoom. Can you all hear us okay? Write in the chat. I want to make sure you can hear me. Um, so, this is really to talk about this is the first of many sessions we hope to talk about the non operation side of business. We're going to talk about some basic fundamental principles, and then we're going to talk about careers and jobs and all that good stuff. Um, I want to start with introductions. So John, since you're in the room, I'm going to start with you. Instead of just the normal who you are and what you do, I'm going to kind of 60 seconds of how you got into this business, how yeah. you got here. So that, that's a great story. So I'm a 2010 alumni of the program. Really excited to be back. How I got into this business, I was bartending Liberty Captain Grill, which I'm sure none of you have ever been to. <laughs> um, and that the business got really exciting for me and ended up loving hotels because bartending to me was it was not that great after a while. And so this is a really good business. And so I started out at Marriott for a couple of years and bounced around and Devon and I, who will speak in a second, actually met Hyatt just shortly after we graduated and ended up getting involved in kind of how we open and develop hotels and did some really interesting deals and some software stuff and learning to be I got into kind of development asset management and um as Andrew just mentioned, I'm at IHG for the hotels and resorts today and oversee development asset management, which is really focused kind of on our luxury uh, space. So I'm really glad to be here and look forward to spending some time with you all today. Great. Okay. Sorry. Uh, thank you. This is my first hybrid talk. This is exciting. Um, so next up, let's go to Mary Beth. Uh, Mary Beth, 
Yes, good morning, everyone. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. I hope you can all hear me clearly. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, excellent. So my name is Mary Beth Kutchall. Um, I am the founder and managing partner of Amara Capital. I started Amara Capital three years ago so while I was simultaneously chief development officer for HVMG, uh, which is an owner operator of hotels throughout the United States. Um, I was with the company for 11 years in which time I did over 90 deals. Um, I personally invest in deals, I've syndicated deals. And um, my background started real quickly in operations. Um, it took me a while to figure out how to get into this seat on the bus. Um, I was in f &B, operations, sales and marketing, property, regional, corporate level. And it was many years into my career that I pivoted and got into the transactional side. And I love it. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to be here today. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I left HVMG to uh, solely focus on Amara Capital and expand it, not just for um, uh, women investors, but uh, minority investors. I'm excited about that. Uh, closed on a multifamily about a month ago in Atlanta. We have a piece of land under contract in Atlanta that we're looking at there doing condos or hospitality. And uh, the best is just starting. And um, thank you for having me. Thanks, Sarah. So let's move to John and your next on the screen. So thank you, Andrea. And uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of today's discussion, especially on a Friday. I know as a student, I used to avoid Friday Friday classes as much as possible. But uh, my name is Jonathan Jager. I'm with LW Hospitality Advisors uh, based in New York. We do appraisals, valuations of, of hotels. We do feasibility studies and market studies. We asset manage hotels um, and we do some litigation support work as well. So really a full service hospitality uh, consulting company doing work all over the United States, Canada, Mexico, and the Caribbean. And I think the, the way that I got into this industry is, is fairly pertinent for the students in the room today is that I was a student at, at Boston University. Uh, I think it was my probably junior year um, when I attended a session just like this. And the speaker was Rachel Rajinsky from Pinnacle Advisory Group. And even though I was nervous and probably shaking, uh, I went up to the front of the room after the, the discussion, introduced myself, somehow finagled myself into an interview with the company. Um, and then shortly after that, I was offered a job to join as a associate, um, which is where I started my career at Pinnacle back in 2008. So thank you. Good morning, good morning, good morning, everyone. I hope that you all can hear me. Uh, greetings from Atlanta, Georgia. My name is Davon Rees. I am the president and founder of Vaughn Group, uh, where we teach people how to become a successful hotel owners and investors. Um, and just like Mary Beth has a, have a fund as well, uh, where we get folks, uh, particularly minorities, to invest in uh, syndicated deals. Uh, so I actually got my start working um, in the hospitality industry like my other counterparts. Um, I did not know uh, uh, about owning hotels or the transactional real estate side. Um, I got my start uh, working as a front desk agent uh, sitting in the seat that you are in today over 10 years ago, over 14 years ago. Uh, I was a front desk agent at the Hyatt where I met John. Um, and uh, while I was at Georgia State University, and I didn't know anything about uh, anything outside of operations until after I graduated, which um, post-graduation, I started uh, learning more about feasibility studies. I took a non-paid internship in order to get that experience, and then I was then uh, learned about the corporate side, asset management, uh, feasibility studies, and did that for about four years, and then transitioned, and uh, uh, the entrepreneurship bug bit me and started my own consulting firm and a, a fund which we acquired at 85 room home two suites by Hilton in El Reno, Oklahoma last year. So um, that's my story and I am here. I love speaking to students. Um, so I'm excited to be here with you all today as well as my other esteemed panelists. And thank you, John and uh, Andrea for the invitation. Uh, super excited to be here with you all. Great, thank you. 
thanks everybody. So like I said, these are experts. Um, this, these folks speak at hotel investment conferences all over the world. And so we're really excited and lucky to have them. We're gonna jump right in and go to our first slide. And I've got my phone not because I'm checking texts or Facebook. I, wait, the Facebook isn't cool anymore, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, whatever it is that you guys check, I'm not checking that. Um, I've got a number of ALL. So on top of how amazing and wonderful and big our industry is, such numbers, for the purposes of this conversation, the first half of 2021 had $30 billion of hospitality investment. That's during the pandemic, and that's half of so this is big, this is a big space, there's a lot of money in it, so that's why we want to talk about it. So I'm going to go to the next slide. And we're going to talk, um, Doug, Devon, I'm going to throw this out to you. So why would somebody want to invest in hotels and um, how is it different than other asset classes of real estate? It's so funny that you have the Monopoly board game up there because that's actually what I teach uh, my students and what I teach people who are one, looking to get into the hotel space or two, they didn't know that they could get into the space. And in Monopoly, so I'm sure just about everybody in the room, if they haven't, maybe sometime when they were growing up, who all played Monopoly, right? Raise the hands. I can't see y'all. So John, y'all gonna have to help me. I can't, I can't see. So y'all gonna help me out. How, how many of y'all played Monopoly growing up? Uh, yeah everybody uh, right and so y'all remember so how many houses did you have to buy to get a hotel <laughs> i don't remember that y'all remember that four four the boom there we go four four right so four <laughs> houses you have to buy to get to the hotel right so even playing that game while i was growing up i still did not think of owning a hotel right i didn't think it was possible um, but now, and also why I didn't think of that, because when I got my start working as a front desk agent, Hyatt actually owned the hotel I was working for. So I didn't even know that people like me could own a hotel. But here's a fact for y'all. Over 60% of the hotels in the United States are actually owned by small businesses. Yes, 60%, over 60% of the hotels are owned by small businesses. So that, that means people like yourself, when you grow up one day, you make all these millions and millions of dollars. Uh, being successful, uh, and you can buy a hotel. And so one of the reasons why people actually look into hotels as a investment opportunity, because hotels is actually an operating business sitting on real estate, right? So it's very lucrative. So not only are you buying real estate, right? But you're buying the uh, business that sits on it. Um, so that's why a lot of people like to diversify their assets. And another th reason why people like to invest in hotels, because it's a job creator. Um, hospitality is one of the very few industries where you can actually start off as a front desk agent or a dishwasher and become a CEO or even, even become a hotel owner. Um, so we implore what probably like one out of eight jobs. So that's another reason why people like to invest in hotels. Um, one thing about this, it differentiates itself from multifamily and other asset classes. So hotels is you rent it out based off a nightly lease, right? So meaning you have a a different rate every night um, as opposed to if you're buying a multifamily or an apartment complex you know you're, you're you're in that one year you know two year lease and you really can't change the rates but when you're buying into a a, a hotel um, you're able to fluctuate it so if y'all have questions are we making this interactive Andrea I didn't know are we doing yes. how are we doing yeah, that yeah. yeah so let's go to the next slide real quick and then got a question you can put it in the chat or if you're in the room raise your hand or i'm going to stop kind of regularly for questions okay so Devon, anything you want you want me to go move on or anything else you want to yeah on? yeah let's keep it going okay all right i like it um so next slide so when we think about um where the money comes from for hotels uh sources indicate that investment capital are similar to ratios of other real estate classes Yeah, thank you, Andrea. So it's interesting about where the money has come from and where the money is coming from right now. And I'll talk about historical. 
To Devon's point, uh, there are a number of hotels in the industry, in the US especially, that are owned by families and owner operators. Uh, they may have one or uh, three or five or 10 hotels, uh, but a lot of these folks could be, uh, it could be a motel, it could be, um, it could be uh, something on a roadside, it could be something at the beach or resort that they've owned in their family for a couple of generations. So there are a lot of high net worth individuals or people who kind of put the sweat equity in and were able to make uh, the next hotel happen and a bigger hotel and bigger hotel. Uh, so that is a that is big chunk of what we've got. Um, if you all are familiar at all with AHOA, it's an American, Asian American Hotel Owners Association. It represents thousands of hotel owners. And some of these folks have, like I said, one or a few properties. So there's that bucket. There's also the bucket over the past um, uh, couple decades that have been growing um, is private equity. And this is money that are, that's raised in a fund. Um, and it's, it's raised for a, a particular purpose such as uh, buying or um, building, mostly buying hotels. Um, that has been a very popular vehicle to, uh, to acquire assets. Um, I've personally worked with a lot of these groups. Uh, what I was saying as far as there's been a bit of a shift where the equity is coming from, and what I mean by that is that many of these PE groups have been hit very hard during the COVID period of time. Um, you know, promotes, I'm not sure if you're familiar with a promote, a promote is kind of the back end uh, value that you get from putting a deal together and having it be successful and um, make profit. Uh, part of, uh, most of that has been wiped out uh, due to COVID with a lot of properties. Not all properties, there are a number of hotels that are doing very well by the beach um, or in leisure markets. Uh, but there have been many PE groups that, and, and owners that have suffered because of COVID. So uh, there's been a, there will be a continuation of PE groups, absolutely. But what we've seen recently in the past, I'd say year and a half, is that there's been a lot of new equity, non-traditional equity that's entered our space. Um, and it's, it's quite fascinating. And I think a lot of it started off as trying to raise equity for distressed assets. Uh, the distressed assets just have not come like we thought they would, which is great for the hotel owner. There's been a lot of banks that have worked through that. But what's interesting is this equity has come from other sectors. And what I'm starting to see is I'm starting to see, and we're going to talk about this in the future, we're starting to see how it's affecting cap rates because of how they evaluate deals. They're bringing that type of evaluation, that purview, and they're bringing that to now how we look at hotel deals. So, it's re so the money is somewhat the same, new money's coming in, and it's kind of changing how deals are being underwritten and the type of targeted returns that people are looking for. Um, and I do think there's going to be more and more consolidation when it comes to hotel ownership um, over the years to come. Um, so there's, that's a little bit of a, I could go on and on, but I don't want to take, take all the time. That's a little bit about, uh, where the money comes from. Um, so there's a lot of words in there that, um, I wouldn't have known and it's obviously a few things I that kind of learned. So thank you very much. <laughs> and we're going to talk about cap rates in just a few minutes, like Mara said, in the meantime, I'm going to pause for questions online or in the room. Okay. Um, I, uh, I, the, when Mary Beth talked about distressed assets, mm -hmm. is that like businesses that have closed because of COVID or yeah. couldn't make it? So that's a great, okay, the mics. Oh, I'm going to go closer to the mic. So you may not be able to see me, but you'll be able to hear me. So we'll talk about distressed assets. It's a great, um, John, do you want to give us kind of a two minute on distressed assets and what was supposed to happen during COVID, what we all thought would happen and what didn't, and maybe head over to the mic? Yeah. So, so, so simply a, a distressed asset, right, is an asset in essence that um, during COVID, if you can imagine, performance substantially went down, uh, property's ability to then pay their debt service was severely impacted. And what we thought would have happened is a lot of properties would have gone through things like foreclosure, right? Think about like a house. You don't make your mortgage payment. What does the bank do at the end of the day? Well, what's different in this cycle versus in 2008 is in 2008, 
a lot of properties were seized, banks foreclosed. Obviously, a lot of people um, went back to just like in the house, in the house, the more residential mortgage market. In this crisis, banks were very supportive, and there was a lot of pressure from government institutions like Washington to be very supportive with that. And so we just didn't see the distress come to market the way all of us and frankly the whole industry uh, thought it was going to at the end of the day, which in many ways is good for the hotel owner and, and, and kind of the small business that Mary Beth and Devon and Jonathan spoke of as well. Great. So yeah, I think John made a great point. If you think about like a housing market, so say your neighborhood or there's a neighborhood in your town that had a whole bunch of crime and everything's bad, it's all over the news, bad, bad, bad. And you think, hmm, I got so much cash laying around. I'm gonna buy a house over there because the prices are really low. So when things get cleaned up, I'm gonna make a bunch of money. And that just didn't happen. So everybody was standing on the sidelines with bags of cash, right? Greedy, tapping their fingers, <laughs> ready to buy up some hotels because hotels obviously suffered during the pandemic. People weren't traveling and they never went on sale. So that's a great thing, um, unless you want to buy a hotel and make a bunch of money. <laughs> so um, I'm going to talk, we're going to move next. I'm going to go back to Devon real quick. Um, Devon is great at setting the foundation for us. So we're going to talk about brands. Like she said, there are brands, we assume Hyatt, Aishin, Marriott, Hilton, all big brands. Why would, if I open a hotel, why would I want to put a brand on it? Because guess what? I don't get to put their brand on for free. So why would I want to spend that money? And so Devon, I'm going to give you a couple minutes to talk about brands real quick. Sure. Before, and that was that's actually a really great question. I get that a lot because I work with a lot of first-time hotel owners and a lot of times people, they want to actually start their own brand. And I'm like, guess what? We do not need another brand. We have <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of hotel brands. I don't think, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think you can create something that's already out there, right? Um, but going back to ver brand versus independent, talk, I didn't talk too much about risk. And actually, this is one of the risk factors, right? Um, one thing about uh, uh, about the hotel space, um, as far as there's a lot of risk associated, right? It's a lot of risk. Um, it's been, and the hospitality industry relates a lot to the economy. So as Andrew and John just talked about, and Mary Beth just talked about, it's hard to distress hotels uh, during when there's an economic downturn. Um, uh, typically, the hospitality industry is hit hard, right? So we just talked about how you know, a lot of people thought, even I thought that there was going to be a lot of dis distressed properties or a lot of opportunities to buy a lot of hotels um, because there was an economic downturn, but that didn't happen. So essentially, there is a lot of risk associated with buying <laughs> hotels because it depends a lot on what's going on in the economy. Um, now, going back to, so there's three things. I want y'all to get your paper out and notes. So ho hopefully, everybody should be taking notes on paper, phone, iPad, Android, whatever, whichever one you have notebook um there are three things that makes a hotel successful right so we have the location of course what did what do we we've been talking about this so far that hotels actually a type of real estate so location is key right that's just number one in real estate the next thing is brand and then operator so i'm going to talk about a brand so the reason why those are the three recipes to a success because for one again location you know think think about the hotels that you say to just about everybody in that room i'm sure has checked in a hotel if not, I want to meet you because I've yet to meet somebody that hasn't checked in the hotel. And you stayed at that hotel because it was located, regardless if it was with your parents or if it was spring break, you stayed at that, you stayed at that hotel because of the location, right? Where it was, if it was near the beach, it was near Disney World. If your parents were visiting you at school and they're staying at the local hotel near your school, they're staying at that hotel for a particular reason. That's the first thing. Then the second thing that I'm going to talk about is brands, right? So a lot of times people, how many people grew up staying at Embassy Suites or in any particular brand? We're going to make this interact. I got to make sure y'all up. It's a Friday. So how, what, 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 what are y'all favorite brands? People in the chat, throw it out. What are y'all favorite hotel brands? Hilton. 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 Yeah. Hilton. What else? Put IHG people in the room. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I would say somebody has to say IHG, right? Somebody just like has for like an extra chat. bonus point. Like somebody just got to say IHG, you know, John. <laughs> IHG. <laughs> yeah. IHG, okay, very Yeah, I, 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 own a, I have never seen a candle with tweets. They're great. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Right? So brands and those brands. Y'all probably grew up saying it, those particular brands. So y'all grew up with them. Y'all fell in love with it. Doubletree has its cookie. 
you know, Embassy Suites has the breakfast. You know, y'all probably stayed at the Moxie, so they got that cool lobby going on. If y'all old enough to drink, y'all probably got a little drink at check-in. So <laughs> all of those things are brands, right? Um, and you stay at those brands because you either grew up with them, you're familiar. So if you checked in at the, the Hampton Inn in New York, and I y'all may not have heard of Americas, but Americas, Georgia, which is a small town in rural Georgia, you kind of get that same feel and you'll prefer to stay there because you stayed at a Hampton Inn. You stayed at a Doubletree. Your parents took you to Embassy Suites a lot growing up or they took you to Hilton growing up. So as, typically as you grow older, you're like, you know what? I remember staying at these brands. Now I may not stay at the brand, the hotel that my mom, you know, that my mom and that my parents took me to, but I want to stay in that Hilton family. And then you have the operator who's going to operate the day-to-day -day operations. So going back to the brand versus independent. The reason why um, I prefer brands over independent, for one, we just talked about those different brands. I didn't hear anybody say, you know, I don't really like a brand. I prefer saying independent. I always hear these are my favorite brands, right? Because people, they want to stay at something that they're familiar. They know what they're getting. Like if they go into the double tree, they know they're going to get that hot chocolate chip cookie when they check in, right? So as far as brands were, say it again, say it again, John. I said absolutely nothing. Keep going. <laughs> keep going, keep going. And so going back to those brands versus independents, right? So independent hotels, um, which are great, you know, there's some, but it also depends on the market, right? So an independent hotel may do well in New York City, may do well in San Francisco, but, you know, in a market maybe like Atlanta, or a market, you know, where a market meaning the location or city, it may not do well because people may not understand that particular brand, right? They may not, they may have never heard of it and they're not familiar with it. And so there's some risk associated with going between, uh, choosing between an independent hotel and a branded hotel, right? Just one for that brand loyalty, you know, people want to stay there. And then also when you're, when you now, I'm, now I'm putting on my owner hat, right? So a lot of people, why, a lot of reasons why people actually want to buy a hotel with a brand because they're buying into that reservation system, right? They're buying into those points, those Marriott, you know, Bonvoy, you have Hyatt, which is the world of Hyatt. I don't know if y'all are part of any member, you know, IHD or Hilton. I don't know if you all are, are students and y'all accumulate any points, but that's another reason why. Um, as far as chain versus independent, do we y'all had a slide up? Oh, here we go. Here we get a slide. So we have the US, as you can see, the US has over 70% when it comes to chain hotels and then 30% independent. But then you see the opposite for Europe, right? I mean for not Europe, but for outside of the United States. Um, because you know, as far as with the different brands, um, they're growing. But European, I don't say Europeans, but a lot of international um hotels they're uh they they can it's okay to do it independent right it's okay to to because people are more of our experiences there as opposed to we created a culture we have more of a brand right so as far again turning on my owner hat with the chain versus independent um and again why owners sometimes choose to go with a brand because they're buying into that reservation system so that means you know, if a person, when, when y'all get into the workforce and y'all, you know, start working for jobs or building a career and you have to travel a lot, a lot of times what people do, they start building up those points. So that way they can use their points. They can take a family trip in like Hawaii or Aruba or go to Australia. So that's another reason why brands, a lot of people choose brands over independence. Do we have any questions? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Javon. Any questions on that? Because we could spend three days or honestly a whole semester talking about brands versus independent. And there's a lot of costs associated with going with a brand. If you are independent, you have to spend those marketing dollars yourself. You don't, like Javon said, you don't have access to your frequent travelers. There's a lot of pros and cons there. Um, the, big, the biggest thing is the cost, like you said, Andrea. The, the biggest thing is cost is independent because you're competing with you know, Marriott and Hilton, who's been around for over a hundred years. And so you're trying to convert a guest who's been staying with Hilton and Marriott for pretty much their entire life. And now you have to figure out a marketing strategy, which can be expensive, or you have to give money to OTAs. Does anybody know what OTAs? 
Let's, I'm going I'm to pause right there, Dave, because we've got a lot more other than brains to go over, and I'm guessing you covered some of this in your classes, mm -hmm. but um, we'll, we can dig into brains if you want afterwards or in questions. Um, so I want to go to the real estate cycle. Because Good. You know, Andrea, you're such a great moderator. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So I'm going to turn over to Jonathan to talk about the real estate cycle. We touched on this a little bit with distressed assets, but Jonathan, I'm going to let you do the deep dive and just let us know if you want to go to the next slide. Great. Thank you, Andrea. And uh, I would also concur with Devon, you are a pro moderator. So I know I always feel more comfortable when, when, when you're driving the bus. So, um, you know, I, I think probably the most commonly asked question at real estate and hotel conferences um, is, is a baseball analogy. Because people always want to know, I don't know how many baseball fans there are, in, in the room, but people always want to know what inning are we in, right? And so really what they're referring to there is the real estate cycle. It's what you're seeing on the screen in, in front of you now. Um, and I always personally hated that question because it's, uh, first, I mean, I just not, I'm not a big baseball fan. Well, I'm a Yankees fan, so that's why I'm saying that now after they, they lost to the Red Sox in the wild card game. But um, it, it's a really hard question to answer. And I think the reason is because each cycle is a little bit different. So while I, I generally agree, and you know, this, this slide, this real estate cycle is, is something that's probably taught in, in all business schools and it doesn't just apply to hotels, it applies to basically any sort of investment. Um, it's generally true, but because the timing and cycles are all different, it's very hard as we sit here today on October 15th to identify what inning we're in or which part of the cycle that we're in. So when I, when I first started in this business, I used to think that you know, the smartest investors are the ones that time it right and buy low, right? You're always taught, you know, no matter what it is, to buy low. So you want to buy here in, in phase three, which is in the trough. Um, and obviously that's going to be the time when you get the greatest returns is when you buy low, but now that I've seen, and, and I, I think the, the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, which we've been going through now for almost 18 months has sort of, um, you know, it, 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 um, it, it had a, an effect on me in a way that now I think it's not really necessarily about timing the cycle. Um, it's about buying the right asset at the right basis. And I think a great example of that, referring back to what Mary Beth was saying about who the investors are and all the capital on the sidelines today, you look at a group like Blackstone or Starwood Capital, probably two of the largest private equity investors in, in hotel business, and they're out in the market today buying and selling. And so if they were so smart and knew which part of the cycle we were in, they would only be doing one or the other. Um, but the fact that they're doing both short, sort of tells me that it's not necessarily about timing, it's about the right asset and the right market. So if you wanna to go to the next slide, Andrea, um, it's sort of the same, um, the same cycle, but related more to um, the hotel business and what happens. So hotels are a little bit unique in the cycle because what we often see, and this is true going back for a couple of cycles. And so the most recent cycles would be the low point would be around 2001, 2002, after September 11th, we, we increased and we had a positive cycle through about 2008, 2009. A lot of you in the room are probably a little too young to remember exactly what happened with the financial crisis um, in, at, at that time, but that was a, a very severe downturn specifically for the lodging and travel industry. And then we had a pretty strong run for, for 10 years recovering from that and then um, exceeding records, you know, really ever since 2014, 2015, up until March of 2020, when you all know. So those being kind of the, the last two cycles, what we often see is the amount of new supply coming into the market happening at the exact time when fundamentals, and by fundamentals, I'm talking occupancy, ADR, RevPAR, NOI, which is net operating income, starts to decline as we go through the next cycle. The reason for that is because the, the lead time, the development cycle 
takes a number of years as hotels are first conceived, planned, and then ultimately developed and opened. Um, so unfortunately, supply um, is typically highest when fundamentals are going down. That's a little different today because it, it's harder to get projects financed, um, but just kind of one, one example of, of how we go through this cycle. Then as we're in times right now in 2021, the amount of new supply, so you can see on the graph here where it says development slows, we're seeing very few new projects start. And there's a few reasons for that. One is the fundamentals, two is the difficulty of getting construction financing. And so usually now we'll have kind of a low in terms of new supply while the existing hotels are recovering from this downturn. Um, and this has been kind of a prolonged downturn, but very specific nuance to certain markets. So the top 25 markets like New York, like Chicago, like Washington, D.C., um, have been hurt the hardest, whereas um, the resorts, the drive <laughs> hotels have been performing better. Um, so that's really just a quick uh, description of the, the real estate cycle, the hotel market cycle. And then the last slide here, slide 11, is really just about the emotions and, and what you're supposed to be feeling as an owner. So I guess I would ask Devon how, how she's feeling today in terms of emotions, and we, we can see where, where we are in the cycle. <laughs> oh, you want to know how I feel as an owner? Yes. I think Jane always feels somewhere around. <laughs> <laughs> no, Jane. Yeah. No, you. She, she hangs out here. She's been in a cookie hive for ten years. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, my hotel is doing well. Um, we're fully staffed. So again, that optimistic. Oh no! Oh no! Oh, no. <laughs> okay, I'm going to keep us moving. I'll pause for questions. Any questions on the real estate cycle, either on Zoom or in class? All right. Well, just a yes. quick question. I'm just trying to make sure our students know. Like, is it best it, when you graduate to go into operations for a while to learn before you go into this area? Or no, no, we're going to get to that. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. I was giving you a preview. No, we're going to talk about career paths, um, and just because that's what I'm kind of trying to see through this, because I think the career piece is important. So um, I'm going to turn it over to John to talk about cap rates. Um, I will say he is not a professor, but I know he deals with this every day. So you're getting real world experience here. So we'll go to the next slide. So, so I'm going to keep this somewhat high level because we could spend a very long time talking about cap rates. But simply said, a, a cap rate is a way to value a hotel, right? Just like to keep it kind of the monopoly example. When you all look to value a, a home, what do you do? Like you go to Zillow, you look at this estimate, you maybe ask a broker, maybe you make it up, who knows? But, but also if you think about how to value a hotel, what we use in essence is a cap rate. And so the simple way to get a value is you take the property net operating income, which Jonathan touched on just a second ago, the profit, the free debt profit for a hotel, you divide it by a cap rate, which we'll come back to in a second, and that simply gets you the hotel valuation. So what the hell is a cap rate? A cap rate is in essence an intrinsic measure of risk associated with the asset. So for a hotel, cap rates are numbers. So we simply use a three cap, a four cap, seven cap, eight cap, and so on. And so when you do that, and you apply a, a certain number, which is the measure of risk associated with the deal, that'll end, end up giving you the value. Can you kind of pause there? Because ca cap rates are a really fundamental part of real estate, but I want to make sure this is a, this is a really important concept for, for how we look at uh, hotel finance. Does that make sense, everybody? Have we with me so far? And I'm being told to move. So, anyone want to take a guess? What do you think happened to cap rates over the past 18 months with hotels or real estate in general? Hopefully, everyone's saying gone up a little bit. Probably a little bit more risk in hotels, perhaps. <laughs> a little bit. So, if you think about cap rates, the other way to look at it is also there are lots of types of hotels, right? There's entry level select service, there's some of the stuff I work on, which is crazy luxury resort kind of stuff. And so cap rates aren't applied the same, right? There's a lot of measures that go into a cap rate. The chain scale of a hotel, maybe even the market, right? We touched on location a bit earlier. 
And so you could have the exact same box, but be in two different markets and have two different cap rates. And so what I would just simply pause and then any of the other panelists can layer into this, cap rates are very unique to the market, the asset and the type, but ultimately that's how you end up valuing a hotel in total. Any of the other panelists want to add anything? I thought I'd keep this somewhat high level, but wanted to at least kind of touch on the topic holistically. Yeah, I'll jump in because I, I kind of highlighted it earlier. We are definitely seeing a shift in cap rates when we're evaluating deals and we're underwriting. Some of these new investors are, um, are actually very comfortable with lowering their cap rates in their, with their exit. So because of that, uh, they are paying more for opportunities than we have historically been seeing in the past because of the type of new money that's come in. And I don't think that's gonna go away. I really do think there's gonna be a slight shift in, in cap rates, purchase and exit cap rates um, with the industry with this new money that is pretty dominant in our space. Um, so that's one thing. And another thing is I think, you know, if we have been for a number of years, we've been seeing independent properties trade at pretty aggressive cap rates. And I think that's continuing to be the case where maybe about 15 years ago, it was much more uh, the brands were trading at a stronger cap rate. So a couple of things just to share that I'm seeing change in the industry. Question. Um, can you pop that question up one more time? Sorry. Who let, let Rumbi in? Yeah. <laughs> um, Rumbi. Yeah, Mary's about to show the real estate investor cost cycle. Um, yeah, we can share the slides. I'm not sure investor cost cycle. I'm not sure it holds up. And then the NOI and hotel market values go down. Um, do you want to answer that question, Mary? So, what do you think happened to NOI over the past year? Anyone have a guess? And Mary Beth touched on this already. Went down, right? Yeah. And then we'll it depends, right? It depends on the market. Well, well so in the yeah. very beginning, right? Okay. In the yeah. very beginning, yeah. March, everything dropped. Yeah, March 2020 for the few months, yeah. everything went down yeah. for sure. And then since then, like John said, it's certainly been based on market. Um, and we talked about market value and distressed assets. So I think we touched on most of that. Um, you know, think about where you're staying, right? You're going on vacation, you're going to be uh, maybe downtown Atlanta, big box hotels are having conferences. So it's really dependent on kind of what's happening in the world. I do want to touch on one last thing before we move on. There's one important thing when you think about a hotel valuation it doesn't consider. Anyone have any guesses on that? Which is important as kind of, we have different investment professionals on the call. It doesn't consider your capital stack meeting your debt or equity in the deal. So I just wanted to highlight because that's obviously think about investment as a key part of how you look at a deal, but the valuation does not consider where that capital is coming from and how it's sourced like Mary said. Great. So Mary Beth, I'm gonna throw it back to you. Let's talk, let's talk through some sample deals and give us an idea of how all this works. So if you think about some of the single owners like we were talking about with Ahoa, that John was talking about, so that's me, maybe a couple of my friends, I borrow some money and put a down payment down and I buy a hotel. That we get. Let's talk about some of the more complex deals that you were talking about. We've got private equity, we've got money from all over the place, several different sources. Can you talk us through kind of how that could work? Certainly, so sure. So learned already. Yes, I'm happy to do that. I'll give an example of a deal that we did um, that was probably one of my favorite deals. I'm looking at um, the uh, tombstone on my in my office right now. Uh, it was, and a tombstone is basically a marker that you get that has all the, the sales price and all that of, of the property um, that the brokers typically give you once you close. But in 2014, um, we identified uh, troubled embassy suites in the Galleria area of Atlanta. Um, it had been impacted by the last downturn. Uh, it was uh, d d d had no new capex. It was very tired. Um, it was performing incredibly poorly. It was probably number five in its comp set. So, you know, not performing with market share or top line or bottom line for that that matter. Um, 
it was a it's a 261 room hotel embassy suite. So um, we were able to um, identify a capital partner. Um, we went after it a couple of times. We eventually bought it in deed of lieu of foreclosure um, from Deutsche Bank. And uh, so, and then we were able to um, transition over HVMG into management. Um, and the thesis was we're going to, we're going to renovate this property very substantially, um, and we are going to reposition it in the marketplace and exit. Uh, and so what we really loved about it were a few things. We loved the brand. Um, Embassy Suites is a what we call our uh, category killer. Um, it does phenomenally well. It should do phenomenally well. And this one was so underperforming. Um, it typically should be number one in its comm set if everything is all the same as far as location, quality, et cetera. Um, this was not the case. It had a great location, but everything else was broken about it. Um, we had some wonderful associates that had been at the property with the previous management company and actually a few different management companies. And they had um, such tenure and loyalty, but they were just deflated. Uh, so we knew we had talent to work with. We just needed to bring the right culture and, and show them that what the hotel, we were gonna do with the hotel and get them excited again. Um, so long story short, what we wound up doing is we wound up putting $12 million into the property. Um, I think it was in excess of 58,000 a key. And when we say keys, we mean rooms. That's one of uh, our little terms in the industry. And we're also very famous for our, um, our abbreviations um, on things. So you'll hear some of that, you know, NOI would be, you know, net operating income and ADR would be average daily rate. But long story short, over a series of a year, um, we, we redid the lobby. We completely revamped the rooms. Um, everything was completely brand new, um, repainted the property, et cetera. It was, it was a very heavy lift. Um, I would say all in, we were after purchasing the property and renovating it for $12 million, we were all in about $34 million. Um, at, the operations team did a great job. Everything went beautifully as we had planned it to. Um, you know, the, the previous uh, revenue for the property was 10 million. We took it up to 13.1 within a year and a half. Um, NOI went up 61%. Um, we were able to increase the average daily rate by 23.3%. It was just a great, phenomenal turnaround. The property started performing in the marketplace against the comp set and went to number one and has consistently been number one uh, for quite a while. The company still manages the property, but in 2016, three years after we purchased this property, renovated it, repositioned it, and got it performing exceptionally well, we sold it for $56 million. So that's an example of creating value and finding an asset that is um, neglected, uh, poorly performing, believing in the thesis, finding the right capital, getting the right debt, getting the right construction team, and putting all the pieces together to deliver to the ops team to turn the property around and, and drive revenue and profitability. Um, it's probably one of my favorite deals. Um, it, you know, sell, you know, doing all that and, and flipping out in three years and having that kind of financial lift was um, something we're super proud of. So that would be an example. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody may have. They have done a lot of deals. So if that's your favorite, it's gotta be a good one. Um, yeah, it was a good one, yeah. Yeah, so we've got a couple questions online. I'll pause for questions in the room also. All right, um, so the questions online are a little complicated and maybe a step too deep for what we're trying to do here. Um, John and I, and we've already talked, we, we wanna dig deep on cap rates and capital stacks, I think on our next session, mm -hmm. we've already got all laid out. Um, but I want to, Jonathan, go to you. Can we go to the next slide? Sorry. I want to talk, you've heard um, a lot of these folks. Jonathan, can you give us the, and I mean this, like the two-minute summary of this, no pressure, and then we're going to get into career paths and, you know, we save the best for last. Sure. 
Absolutely. Um, two minutes will be tough, but uh, you can just, just mute me after that. And I'll <laughs> start playing your playoff music. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think, I think one, one thing that at least me when, when I was a student that I didn't really fully understand, and I wish I had a, a um, discussion like this available to me when I was in school, um, but I think it's such an important point for you as, as students to, to know is when you walk into a hotel, the ecosystem, as we're calling it here, or um, the stakeholders involved, there's so many different parties involved in a, a hotel. You know, I, I still, you know, as I talk to people not in the hotel industry, you know, just friends or family, you know, people think that you go to a Marriott hotel, that hotel is owned by Marriott, right? But in, in most cases, that is not the case, as Marriott is primarily a franchise and management company. They do own some hotels, um, but not very many. And so, you know, you look at the stakeholders involved, you have owners and just that one category of owners as Mary Beth went through earlier. Um, and that's that first kind of big blue box there. You have REITs, which is real estate investment trust. You have private equity, you have sovereign wealth funds, which are, you know, can be international investors, which are big, big players in the U.S. hospitality market, institutional um, owners, meaning kind of big institutions or, um, you know, groups like, like, like Blackstone and Starwood Capital that, that I, I mentioned, KSL Capital, uh, public agencies, you could have cities, you could have states, you could have airport authorities that actually own hotels. Um, high net worth is HNW or family office, more kind of private owners. Um, and then you have a lot of owner operators. And that, these are just some examples. There's many different types of groups that, that could own, own hotels. And so you have, that's just in the ownership box, right? And then you have an asset manager, someone typically like, like us that's overseeing the asset on behalf of the owner. Um, and then you go down the line to the management company, a group like HVMG um, or Pyramid Hotel Group or Ambridge Hospitality, which recently took over and merged together. These are companies that manage the day-to-day -day operation of the hotel. They're agents on behalf of ownership, um, but really are um, doing the activities of managing the hotel. Um, everything from you know, selling the rooms to servicing the rooms, handling the accounting and the finance and the HR. Um, and, and then you go down the line here to property chain and, and, and guests. And think about all the service contracts that you need in a hotel, you know, for elevator maintenance, for landscaping, um, the utilities that you need. Um, try not to scare anybody away, but owning a hotel is a very, very difficult and complex um, thing to do uh, because of all the intermediaries in, involved. And so you really have to have a good handle on that um, and kind of what the ecosystem is because it's much more complicated than owning residential office uh, or other types of, of real estate. Was that was that two minutes, Andrea? Am I good? Perfect. I don't know how long that was, but it was great. Um, okay, any questions on how the players involved? Yeah, all right, so I'm gonna start, I wanna talk about how to get from where you are now if you wanna get into the investment side. Robin asked a great question. Does it make sense to get into operations first? Can you go straight to the investment world? What's the path? So I wanna save time and let each of you go through and answer it. So that means, again, you've got about two minutes each. Um, save on. <laughs> so um, if we can... <laughs> Um, okay, so if we can kind of keep it brief, what do you look for when you're hiring? You have all hired people. What do you look for when you hire? Um, what kind of experience do you want? What do you think the ideal kind of track is? And um, Jonathan, I'm going to stick with you and start, start there. Thank you. Yeah, it's, um, I, I always recommend that people start in operations. So when I was in college, I, I worked at a hotel up, up in Boston, thousand room hotel. And I would argue there's no better way to learn the hotel business because to work on the real estate side and acquire hotels or asset managed hotels or underwrite hotels, I think without that operating experience and knowing how to check someone in, or how to handle a guest that's yelling at you about something that is very trivial. Um, you know, seeing how the operation, how the sausage is made, I think is so valuable. So I always do recommend 
at least a couple years of ops experience before transitioning to, to real estate. Um, we also find a lot of success in hiring people with one or to two or three years of experience in revenue management, um, accounting and finance, because a lot of what we do um, is numbers based. And I know a lot of students, you know, the accounting and finance classes are probably your least favorite. Um, but I would say they're the most important if you want to work in on the real estate side of the business. Uh, yeah, so, um, you know, I've been asked this question a lot. And um, I think if you want to get into the transactional side where you are, um, you are evaluating real estate opportunities, hospitality opportunities, and you're new and learning, I think there are two tracks where you could accelerate your skill set the fastest. I mean, sure, you can do it yourself and and you know talk to people and try to learn, but I think there's some gaps that are going to happen because of that. But from a sophisticated perspective, I would say if you can get yourself into an analyst role at um, a real estate platform, whether it be um, a PE group or a management company that's evaluating deals on a financial level. I think that would be um, really uh, a really good path because you are going to learn about the ins and outs of P&Ls and um, property performance from a PAR and a poor perspective. And that's basically um, price, uh, it's a uh, it, um, per available room or per occupied room. And there are a lot of nuances to really underwriting correctly. Um, a lot of levers and it takes a, a bit to master. So you're going to be seeing lots and lots of deals. So that's one path. The other path I would say would be coming through the brokerage side of the business where you would be doing something similar, but you would be helping owners um, dispose of their assets or sell their assets. And because of that, you're going to be involved in putting together um, an offering memorandum and understanding uh, what one would look at when it comes to looking at a hotel real estate deal, you know, the market, the performance, uh, market share, um, all the all the different levers again. But you'll also be seeing high level um, projections as well because brokers do that. So, and you're you're surrounded either path. You're surrounded by people who are farther down the path, and you're going to see a lot of different deals, and you're going to be able to quickly accelerate your learning about what to watch out for and um, what, uh, what, what one looks for when trying to find the right opportunity. Because I tell you, when things go south and they do in this industry, it's very cyclical. Um, it's very easy to um, misstep. Uh, and, uh, and there's nobody likes having to write capital call checks. Um, so uh, the more that you can learn and the more you can surround yourself with people who have a lot of experience and learn everything you can from them, uh, the faster you'll ex accelerate your, your um, experience as well. I agree with both uh, Jonathan and Mary Beth. Um, I would definitely recommend that you start off in operations um to really understand how it works um so when you're analyzing deals or when you're looking at deals or asset managers or whatever you understand um some of the the complications that can happen with the hotel um, um also transitioning from operations into an analyst role um as mary beth mentioned i think is also a good pathway to getting into the transactional side or real estate side because you're understanding the numbers you're applying what you've um, learned um, or your experience in operations, I mean, it's just, an, it'll be an easier transition again to understanding the finance or the economics um, of whatever direction you get into as far as asset management, brokerage, but a good way to start would be from operation into an analyst and then move your way up. Right. Was that less than two minutes? It was perfect, Davon. Thank you. Um, John, I'm going to send you to bring home. Yeah, so I think everyone hit on, on really good points and kind of different ways you can get there. I think that the fundamental themes are getting exposure to underwriting, getting exposure to market feasibility, getting exposure to kind of investment pieces and, and capital structure and what that looks like. And there's a lot of ways to get there. There's some quicker ways and different ways to look at that, but also those are kind of the skill sets, right, that you're trying to obtain from the day. So um, I think, you know, obviously in South Carolina, there's a lot of opportunities to get there as well. And, and Andrew and I can both stay behind and kind of talk to you about specialists like you, and maybe you're given that you wear your shoes. 
Don't you dare say how many years. <laughs> <laughs> a few, few years ago. So um, we'll, we'll pause there. All right. So we're right on schedule, but if there's any questions, we'll take them quickly. Um, yeah. All right. Any online? Great. Oh, okay, yeah. I just want to, uh, you know, we're talking about cap rates and the effect of, you know, COVID and everything. Are you seeing, I know we see different cap rates for, say, a resort versus downtown and stuff. Are you seeing differences in region? And the reason I ask that specifically is because what we're seeing is that maybe state policy regarding COVID, I'll use Florida as an example. I mean, they opened it wide up. And so Florida right now, you know, I, I work with a, uh, resort down there, and we're seeing record numbers. Um, and other resorts say in the Northeast are just dying. So, are you are you seeing a regional effect on cap rates? Short answer: Yes. Okay. But I'll let them. That's good. Give. I would even see a micro region effect in yeah. many ways. Really? Yeah. I mean, it, 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 Florida, yes, but you know, if you look at cap rates today, and, and the other panelists can chime in. It's so localized. I would say it's micro region. Right? It's not. It's not enough just to say, "Oh, Florida is doing well." Right. Resorts are doing well. There's a lot of nuances within that, right? So, mm -hmm. I think I would take it to the micro region. But any other panelists want to chime in on that? Oops, Mary Beth muted. Sorry, it should be. We joke it should be a drinking game, like every you know. <laughs> I should <laughs> say that. <laughs> yeah, there's always one, and that be me. Um, so um, yeah, we we for sure are. Um, you know, it's interesting. Twenty twenty has been a blip, as twenty twenty one has, and deals are being evaluated off of two thousand nineteen revenues. It's like this whole COVID thing hasn't even happened. Um, so that's interesting. It is amazing to me the, the difference in markets. Um, when you look at leisure markets, when you look at anything with toes in the sand, uh, national parks, ski resorts. Um, I was in Park City earlier this week uh, and, and visiting with a GM there of a Marriott hotel. She said that her performance is um, ex exceeding 2019. And so you can appreciate that impact that some markets and some properties are having versus others. And then there are city center hotels, um, you know, a couple that I'm invested in. And it's all, it's big hotels, business transient, group house. And they're still not back. They're far from being back. Though I do think it's gonna it's gonna take a bit, you know. It's you know, but still, it's it's schizophrenic. And so, when it comes to cap rates, uh, we are definitely seeing leisure uh, leisure opportunities trading at very aggressive lower cap rates because that's where the money wants to be. I think they feel that is a better play for the next several years. And they're probably right um, how travel travelers are shifting and, and the whole hybrid of working and staying and the desirability of leisure markets. So I, long, long winded answer, but absolutely. Yeah, I think I've been traveling to the US the last couple of years. So what I've seen trends, a couple of things is that uh, it depends on the governor of the state, if, if the state is open, the people are going to travel to. The other one is a lot of open areas like the out west or in Florida and stuff that uh, people want to get out. But the other one was people have been set up for two years, almost a year and a half. They're all ready to go. So you're doubling the vacation time for people that normally would be going from here to here. But there's, that's what you're seeing out there is how many people are traveling just because they were all saved up vacation time. And then now they're all out and about all at one time. Yeah, saving up their money too, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And then they're traveling in the US. Well, I'm not I'm not buying a plane ticket to Europe. I'm not doing that. So I'm mm -hmm. gonna spend all my money here. So they're happy to spend the exorbitant rates that you know a luxury or resort property used to be three hundred dollars a night, now six hundred dollars a night, and everybody's like, sure, take my money. Mm -hmm. Let's go, let's have fun. All right, we are behind schedule, so we will stay around, answer any questions, but I'm sure you guys have stuff to do. So thank you. Very thank much you. for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.
Thank you guys so much for attending. Hi. Uh, Thank you. A little bit later today. Thank you guys so much. Good, how are you?